much uh, for having me. Just click yes to the recording. So thank you for having me. Uh, it's nice to meet people uh, from the Texas data community from Europe. Uh, I assume you are mostly from Europe. You could be from uh, anywhere else in the world, I guess. Uh, so I've exchanged from uh, quite a few people during the past years uh, who are doing Texas data uh, in political science, uh, who were located in uh, many different countries in Europe. Uh, so it's fun to see this community uh, develop like this. Uh, so I'm going to present, it's rare that I, that I do that, but <clears throat> I'm going to present a project that is uh, that has been already completed, although nothing is, is ever complete. Um, and I'll be uh, happy to answer questions uh, during uh, the presentation if you have any. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll try to limit myself to, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, please feel free to stop me, Nico, if I'm uh, going too uh, long, and then we can uh, uh, go move on with questions. So I prepared um, a slide. So let me share my screen uh, here. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, this project came about when I joined the University of Toronto. So, this uh, started a very long time ago, about eight years ago, uh, when I joined an interdisciplinary group at the University of Toronto that comprised computer scientists, political scientists, and also historians. So, the, we combined the perspectives of digital humanities up to modern uh, NLP in computer science. And uh, we were working on uh, digitizing uh, parliamentary debates. So um, I'll briefly mention uh, that uh, you may be aware that we uh, have released our collection for Canada. So parliamentary debates from Canada for Canada from 1901 to now are available if you're interested in uh, using that for research purposes. But uh, this project, uh, therefore, uh, um, focusing on parliamentary debates, we also had the substantive questions, and one of them was ideology. So I'm going to present this uh, paper with my colleague, uh, Chris Cochran, who's uh, published a lot about I ideology, how to measure ideology, and how to think about ideology. Uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, this project, uh, is uh, I like to view it as an extension of a famous model in political science, that of Slapin and Proch, that you probably know, the wordfish model, where the goal was to estimate or to predict the word counts uh, occurring in uh, the documents of a given party with a party parameter. And it worked pretty well. As you may remember, that was a, a successful model. The difference here is that uh, we predict not word counts, but individual word occurrences uh, using the context words, the words that are, that are surrounding the target word as predictors, as well as a parameter for parties. So in a sense, there's a connection with, um, with uh, uh, the word fish model. However, the estimation technique is different. So the history of this project, so once again, it started, um, it started um, about eight years ago. And uh, the, uh, the idea at the time was that if there were different uh, approaches available to represent parties in a vector space or represent documents in the vector space, some of you may be familiar with latent uh, semantic analysis or LSA. Uh, and at the time when I was working on that, the Lee and Mikolov document embeddings model uh, came out, and I was uh, informed of that by my colleagues. And the idea was that in a word embeddings model, a model where you predict the occurrence of a word by the surrounding words, you could also include indicator variables for the document. And from that came the idea of... Uh, including political metadata as additional predictors in that model. And this is where uh, the study uh, came from. We initially, we applied it for Canada only. And then I met um, a student uh, who had done it on a different corpus that had done something similar, John Ney, 
uh, using a uh, different U.S. corpus. So it sort of validated that this could work. And to be honest, at first, when we tried it for Canada, the results appeared too good to be true. So I was very skeptical. And it took probably five years uh, from the, the, the beginning of that project until uh, it was published, and it's maybe more than five years. One of the reasons is that uh, we were working on digitizing the Canadian corpus. So we created the essentially the corpus for Canada that we originally used. But also, I really wanted to make sure that it was not just a fluke or just not just chance that it worked well in some contexts, but then it, not in others. And I would say even today, I'm not entirely convinced. I'm just moving towards being uh, more and more convincing that there is something there. But in terms of theory, uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with word embeddings now. It's been uh, there all over the place. Uh, when I started working on this, it was the new thing. Uh, but they're very well um, adapted to study meaning in language or semantics. There's the use theory of meaning that states that we essentially give meaning to words by how, depending on how we use them. So it's more of a constructivist approach to language. And my colleague uh, and co-author, uh, Chris Cochran, has this view that ideology also comes, it's very difficult to measure and to define ideology, but it depends on how we, we use uh, words and we use concepts and ideas, and that's how ideologies develop. So there was a, a, a match between uh, the theory that we associate, that we essentially invoke, uh, sometimes exposed to give sense to word embeddings and how they work well at capturing semantics, semantics and, and how ideology, how we think about political ideology uh, and political science. So again, the idea, instead of the word fish model where we, uh, where uh, they predict word counts with a party parameter, what if we predict the occurrence of, a, of specific words using context words and political metadata. So a slight difference that uh, in, in uh, the estimation approach that allows to take into account the full context in which the words are used. So that's the gist, that's the idea behind the study. And uh, like I said, the, 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 the reason why it took so many years to complete is that we wanted to make sure that this work not just on, on one data set, but that, that it could be replicated on multiple data sets. So we use the Canadian uh, Hansard. The, like I said, that's the, the version has been created by our research group. Uh, we also had, um, at the time, we were part of an interdisciplinary and international uh, group of researchers working on digitizing uh, parliamentary debates from multiple countries. So we also had access to the British Hansard which is now available, of course, on the They Work For You uh, website, an even more complete version than what we had at the time. And uh, fi finally, we also replicated with the US uh, uh, Congress uh, debates as well. So uh, just, uh, this is not uh, self-promotion. We're not paid for, for when you use our data set, but just to mention that uh, we released the Canadian version, uh, so the digitized Canadian, uh, Hansard, uh, the debates uh, in the House of Commons for Canada from 1901 to now, and you can download that from lipad.ca website. So I've already mentioned that the, the, the approaches that existed before uh, when uh, we started working on that project were, uh, you probably know word fish and word scores. So these are two approaches that I usually teach the students in my, my courses. There are classical seminal models and uh, they all had limitations. The word fish model uses word counts as, um, as a target uh, variable, as an outcome variable. But uh, by doing so, it doesn't uh, take into account uh, the context, uh, the immediate context in which each word is used. Um, um, in, so the word scores approach required human annotations. So in this case, we won't be uh, needing that. Uh, a little bit like the WordFish model, this, this can be viewed as an unsupervised approach. And also, um, there was a lot of work that's been done, of course, using uh, votes. 
So parliamentary votes to uh, to scale um, or to have estimates of ideology to nominate scores. However, as you may know, if you're familiar with the literature, it is difficult to transfer to apply the same methods to parliamentary systems. There tends to be confusion with the government op opposition dynamics. So our approach um, addresses some of the limitations of previous uh, ones when it comes to measuring ideology. Uh, so. Listen, you are probably by now familiar with uh, word embeddings, and this is a, a schematic depiction, a very a crude a simplification of the model uh, that more specifically corresponds to document embeddings, which means word embeddings where we also add, uh, uh, we can also add additional predictors. And in, in a sense here, what we're doing in this approach is that we're trying to predict the occurrence of a word by the, a window of words that occur around it, so overcoming barriers to work and tackling inequalities. That's an actual phrase that occur that occurs in the British corpus. And then we can associate with each word an indicator variable that indicates the party and also the parliament uh, in which uh, that word was pronounced. And the uh, Word embeddings model, uh, in a nutshell, you can depict them with uh, uh, as a neural network, as a shallow neural network where there's one hidden layer and the coefficients between the input words and the, the hidden node will become uh, the estimates for the word embeddings. And now we'll have an estimate for, uh, for the party indicator variable, similar to the WordFish model, we, have, we included this. And the, the, the thing is here, you can also include other control variables. So in our implementation, we control for uh, the, the, the parliament. So we control for uh, temporal, we have uh, essentially what, what you could call uh, uh, time fixed effects as we would call them in the social sciences, right? And here the output, uh, the target word, that's, and that's uh, uh, estimated using a softmax function, which we call in the social sciences, usually multinomial logistic regression. So if we write that in equations, there's a first uh, equation. You take the average of the embeddings to create the, the hidden nodes in the hidden layer. And then there's the softmax uh, function or similar to a multinomial logistic regression. But the the in fact, that's my uh, my interpretation and probably most people's interpretation of word uh, embeddings, especially the Mikolov et al. implementation was that the, the, the reason why it became so popular is probably because of the estimation technique. So as you can see here, uh, and you probably know that by, by now because these uh, word embeddings are so famous, but this variable is in fact a categorical variable that has multiple categories, right? As many as there are words in the, uh, in the vocabulary. So in fact, there could be 50,000 categories here. So as you know, if you estimate a softmax function or a multinomial logistic regression, you usually have one equation for each of, of the categories. So that would be a ton of categories. And the, in fact, the, the nice trick here uh, for estimation is that instead of using the full uh, set of categories, let's just pick a few ones that aren't uh, the, the target word at random. And for when comes the time for estimation, we haven't invited, inv invented that. That's the negative sampli sampling technique. So instead of using the full vocabulary, uh, pick at random uh, a, a few words that aren't the target word and uh, you, that will simplify the estimation of the softmax function here. Uh, so the, the complications are mostly at the stage of estimation. And what we did here was just adding political metadata into the model, essentially a, a simple extension of the, um, of the document embeddings approach by Lee and Mikola that uh, was published in 2014. Uh, hopefully that was clear enough and that you're familiar enough uh, with uh, with that uh, model by now, but I can come back to to it. There's lots of uh, issues with uh, the choice of parameters and so on. Lots of uh, um, questions to discuss when when to think about when comes the time to estimation. Uh, but uh, uh, turning to the data we used, so we we had in fact four corpora because we used the U.S. House, U.S. Senate. 
that's from the Stanford group, the Genskow and Shapiro uh, work. They released their uh, full corpus, so we used that. We had two versions of it, but we used theirs. And we have our Canadian corpus, which had, uh, as you can see, the number of speeches here, millions of speeches in, uh, in most cases, and the UK, the British corpus as well. So that's the results. And like I said, uh, at, at first, when we uh, started working on that, like I said at the beginning, we were surprised by it looked accurate, but we wanted to make sure. So we engage in a, a very long process of validation and looking uh, carefully at uh, what we could do and what uh, how, essentially how you can uh, use the method. One of the main ways to use the method is um, once you have uh, an embedding for each of the party and each of the Congress or each of the parliament, similar to what uh, Slapin and Prox uh, did with WordFish, we, we have an estimate, but instead of having one data point, it's, um, it's, a, it's a vector. So it's an embedding that has a dimension that will be, have been chosen at the time of estimation. In this case, it's 200 points. So we can reduce the dimensionality by using a common technique for dimensionality reduction, principal components analysis, uh, and the first component should have uh, should represent the, the the dimension for which there is most variance between uh, the party positions, and the second component would be. Uh, the second dimension for which there's the most variance that isn't correlated with the first. So here, each data point represents the location of a party uh, over time at a, during a specific Congress. So what we noticed uh, here is that we were capturing um, we were capturing dynamics that we knew existed in the U.S. Uh, and uh, I'll try to illustrate uh, that in a moment. The first here is that you may not see this clearly. Is this starts? Uh, this is a, a data set that goes back quite far in time. But this is after the Civil War. Parties were more were closer to each other here in the center. And over time, uh, as is uh, accurate, if you've um, uh, if you've uh, uh, ever um, um, studied American politics, uh, you you will have noticed that over time uh, the Republicans uh, at first had a stronghold in the north. So we interpreted the second dimension to mean the south-north divide, and the first dimension to mean the left-right ideological divide. And it works pretty well if you, as I was saying, uh, if you know about uh, the history of the parties in the U.S. Republicans were first uh, had a stronghold in the in the north as opposed to the south, but then it changed completely. Uh, during the 20th century. And uh, starting from the 60s, the Republicans had a stronghold uh, in the South. And so you, you can see the, the, um, uh, the shift here, the realignment from North to South of the Republican over time. So the Republican, according to our estimates, would have shift, shifted to the right uh, ideologically, but also uh, made a journey towards the North and then to the South. And conversely, for the Democrats, uh, initially moved to uh, to uh, to have a stronghold in the south and then to the north, and also the uh, shifted to the left of the uh, the first dimension, which we interpret to be ideology. How we interpret that? So I'll come back to this in a moment. I see uh, Maximilian. Uh, there's a raised hand. And please go ahead. Um, Nikolai said we will take answers. Uh, sure, but uh, if you're fine with taking uh, questions on the way, we can also do that. Course. Okay, uh, so I thanks for the uh, presentation so far. It's super, super interesting. I just have two small questions regarding this plot. So first is like, are you taking the averages for the whole vocabulary or is, I, I didn't quite get like the embeddings because you get an embedding for each party, for each word, according to what you showed before. That's how I understood it. No, so the embedding uh, for the party in a given parliament will be uh, a set of coefficients or a set of weights as we would, call, we would call them. And the number of weights will be the length of the hidden uh, layer here in the neural network. So here we estimated with 200 nodes in the hidden layer. So our, yeah. all our embeddings have 200 points. And this embedding represents the location of the party. It's an indicator variable, so to speak, of the party in a given con Congress. 
And each word will also have their embeddings, but they're separate estimates. So uh, we have an estimate for uh, an embedding for the party, and we have embeddings for each of the words in the same model. Yeah. But uh, embeddings for each of the words. So you didn't, you basically, because your, your example, sorry, then I just didn't quite uh, quite get it yet. So your example is for one particular word, right? For work, but the embeddings, the, the, the these 200 dimensions would then be for overall words and all vocabularies, correct? Yes, the model will be estimated on all words in the corpus. So there's a lot of... Uh... Uh, okay, estimate, plus uh, one estimate. dimension, which would be your, in your case, your, your party dimension. Yes, it's, a, it's another input in the model. So we'll have which, an estimate for, for the party, yes. Similar to, this, is, this corresponds to Lee and Mikolov's. You can, a simple way to look at this is that in Lee and Mikolov's document embeddings model, the difference here is that you have an indicator variable for the document. However, mm -hmm. here we have one for the party. Okay. Good, cool. Okay, then I understood it. And then, according your piece, like your PCA, uh, how just the technical function? How did you or technical question? How did you make sure that the alignment was in line with the top, bottom, like left, right thingy? Did you run it a few times, or did you use some, because normally, you know, if you run it a few times, it would look differently. I suppose. No? Yes. The orientation may be different. So at any uh, implementation of PCA, you may have to change the orientation to correspond to, to left and right. You can multiply by minus one to, to reorient the scale. So here we just, uh, we present it in a way that is most natural, but this could be mirrored here and uh, you would still have uh, a similar interpretation, but you would uh, have to change the, uh, uh, you would have to reverse everything. So yeah. Cool, thanks, got it, thank you. No problem, uh, thank you for asking. So the, um, yeah, so as I was saying, we, we have estimates for each of the parties and if you, uh, you can project that in a two dimensional space, uh, which facilitates uh, interpretation and visualization. And also you can produce a time series if you want uh, uh, to illustrate the, uh, temporal path, the temporal change in uh, these estimates for party embeddings on the first component or first dimension. Here it's ideology. So as you can see here, we, we find evidence of polarization over time that increased, especially around the 1980s up to now, which is consistent with uh, previous uh, findings uh, about polarization in the US. I may come back to that. And the most spectacular one, we didn't expect to capture that, but is the change in uh, the realignment that happened during the 20th uh, century between the parties where the Republicans uh, here uh, on the second dimension, the second component of PCA, uh, that we interpret. I'll come back to a second and uh, in a second to the why we interpret that as south north. Uh, well, we found we 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 see the the shift, the, the spectacular realignment that actually happened uh, in in uh, American politics between Republicans and Democrats on the second dimension. I'm not sure if other scaling methods. So I've looked at nominate and. Uh, uh, that, that seems to be a result that's quite unique uh, to uh, this approach uh, so far. So how to interpret the axis? So as uh, uh, the previous question was uh, alluding to, well, there is the reorientation, but also uh, more importantly, you want to, uh, we were skeptical at first, as I was mentioning, we spent several years because we wanted to make sure to really, um, uh, that, that it was not just, uh, um, uh, random uh, noise that we were looking at and trying to interpret, but something that is um, uh, that makes uh, sense substantively. So, uh, thankfully, there are many ways uh, using this model the, to help to interpret the results. So we can interpret the axis of the PCA um, uh, dimensionality reduction that I was just showing by. Uh, just projecting the word embeddings in the same uh, PCA model and looking at the words that are closest to each of the uh, the uh, each uh, 
boundary of uh, the first component and the second component. So using Euclidean distances, for instance, you can, as, a, as we did here, you can find the word embeddings that are closest to the edges of the PCA uh, space that we just estimated to represent the parties. And using that, it helps to interpret what the, the axes may mean. Uh, uh, as you can see, the words are closed that are associated with the right end of the first component are uh, words like bureaucracy. Uh, bureaucracies comes a lot. Obamacare, which obviously was a word uh, used by Republicans, mostly red tape. So words that we would typically associate with the right and negative uh, on the on the other side of this first component, we see expressions like decent housing, wealthiest. Uh, racism, uh, poor elderly, segregated, civil rights, words, gun violence, words that we would associate with the left uh, in the U.S. And the reason why we interpreted the second dimension as being north-south, it's, it's pretty clear that here we, we capture discussions that refer to states or locations that are uh, situated in the northern part of the United States for uh, the, the second axis, we find that words like Detroit, Buffalo, Seattle, Minneapolis, Vermont are associated with the, the edge of um, the positive uh, side of the PCA uh, representation. And similarly, uh, words of locations, but also industries associated with the South, like cotton, tobacco, uh, appear uh, closest to the south of that axis. So looking at having word embeddings and party embeddings in this estimated using the same model allows you to, com to compare the words or to uh, examine the association between words and parties. And you can do a lot with this. I don't think we've, we've only scratched the surface of what you can do once you have these estimates. But another way to do this is take the estimate, the party embedding for a party in a given Congress and look at the cosine similarity between the word embeddings and that party embedding as we call them in this paper. And you can rank the words that are most similar and we find uh, um, progressist, uh, progressive terms or terms related to uh, ethnicity, race uh, and um, uh, are associated uh, more strongly with the with the Democrats using cosine similarities, and uh, similarly for the Republicans, we found words um, like uh, bureaucracy, Obamacare, as I, as I was saying earlier, over regulation that typically would be associated with the right. So it's not um, it that alone was not perfect in our mind. So we wanted to go farther than just uh, interpreting the axis and have some kind of uh, uh, way to validate. So we used the classical uh, data sets that were available for estimating ideology. We have three different sources. One is the uh, um, nominate scores for the US, which represents a gold standard. Uh, then we had a collection of experts surveys that uh, estimated the ideological positions. Oh, just before I turn to that, uh, so I was mentioning, just for those of you who are not familiar with US politics, when I said there, there was a shift between the North and South for Republicans and Democrats, just to show you what I'm talking about, if you look at early elections in 20th century in the US, uh, you'll see states, uh, that these are pre presidential elections, but you see that Democrats were very strong in the South, which may sound uh, different uh, from what is the, the situation today. And starting after John F. Kennedy in the, in the 1964 election, then we see uh, this uh, realignment occurring and the Republicans becoming stronger in the South. And that's the thing we capture as, uh, rather surprisingly. It's, it surprised us that we were able to capture that in the second dimension of the model pretty well. And that's the validation I was talking about. So for the US, we had the nominate scores and um, uh, expert surveys. So pairwise pair accuracies for each pair of uh, data points we have. So parties over time, uh, which ones are, uh, what's the percentage that is uh, con or ordered consistently with the gold standard. And we also use uh, Pearson correlations here. So the correlations and the accuracy was pretty good with the gold standards we had for the US. 
And importantly, uh, so we didn't start with the US one. I think um, uh, uh, we, we presented the US one first, but we started with Canadian corpus, as I was saying as at the beginning. So it was important for us to determine whether this worked in a, one country and not in others. So I'm showing you here a similar uh, a PCA visual, visualization of the party embeddings for uh, British parties. And we limited ourselves to the three main parties and uh, over time. So here, the first dimension, uh, according to um, our analysis, we're, we're rather confident that it represents a left-right dimension. So the labor are, is on one side, conservatives on the other side, uh, liberal Democrats in the, in the middle, but also more specifically, we see things like the new labor. So if you're, if you're familiar with following in British politics, you know that when uh, Tony Blair came on, there was the new labor, there was a shift of the labor party to the, towards the center. And we find that, that it's the case here. And usually people will, uh, will um, treat the Thatcher conservatives to be the most right-wing uh, instance of the conservatives. And we also find that uh, in our data set. We did the same for Canada, and we also find consistency with uh, expectations, substantive expectations about where the party should be. So for instance, the Reform Party, the smaller party that uh, we usually associate with to being the most right-wing examples uh, of, um, of parties in Canada, and the NDP is the most left-wing uh, party and we find them opposed. And the second dimension works very well with the regional divide in Canada. So the bloc here is the bloc Québécois, a, a party that represents the, the French Francophone part of Canada, whereas the NDP and Reform Party were more uh, stronger in the Western part of the country. So the second dimension here um, represents the regional divide or uh, Quebec versus um, the rest. Uh, if you will. And uh, the, the first dimension works uh, pretty well with uh, our expectation for left to right. And we also tested that for, uh, as you may know, in parliamentary systems, the nominate scores based on voting um, data don't work uh, as well. They tend, they tend to be conflated or uh, confounded with uh, government opposition dynamics. So here we used uh, expert surveys and comparative manifestos as our uh, uh, as our gold standards, uh, and uh, we find a pretty good accuracy, especially with expert surveys. Uh, the I won't go in details uh, to uh, regarding the different ways to uh, code the comparative manifestos. Legacy measure is one that uh, from my colleague uh, Chris Cochran I may come back to that if you have any questions. So what else? Uh, there's so many other things you can say once you have that model. And we, uh, I'm not saying that I'm entirely convinced. I think ideologies, we're still uh, navigating in the dark, so to speak, and trying to understand how ideology appears. And But after seeing that, at least we could replicate uh, results that seemed uh, sensible in, mo in more than one country, and then uh, being able to validate against uh, different kinds of uh, external resources increased uh, my confidence a little bit. We tested it with politicians. So we did it with, uh, instead of uh, having indicator variables for the party, why not having uh, them for individual politicians like senators? So the downside here is that if you have very few data points, uh, it won't work as well. And when if you move from parties to individuals, then you have less observations, less speeches for each individual. So although senators speak a lot, so we were we thought that's the best way to start. And we had a bunch of um, gold standards to compare against for senators, and it worked pretty well even for individual senators, especially for the most recent uh, congresses. And there's a lot of, I think I'll stop there because I took uh, quite a bit of time, but uh, this is, uh, if you are familiar with word embeddings and you've looked at the tensor board, for instance, you can create your own axes. You can define list of words that will represent custom axes on which you will project 
uh, embeddings. So we haven't invited, invented uh, uh, that, uh, but it can be done easily with any kind of word embedding model. So here, if we select expressions that we want to represent the economic left-right or the social left-right, we, we, um, we can find the list of words we used in our replication materials, but we can also represent uh, parties uh, in uh, in a way that matches our definitions of um, of what the the axes should be instead of using a completely unsupervised approach uh, like uh, PCA. Uh, I won't go into the comparison with. Uh, we won't have time for that. Uh, I think I'll stop here. There's a bunch of other things you can do, like uh, looking at whether topics are correlated with parties over time. So we we included a bunch of these uh, in the appendix, but. Uh, pretty much anything you can think of that involves word embedding, you can do with the same model and then you look at this, the association with the party embeddings. We haven't exploited that so much. I would say the main limitation, if I move to uh, the conclusions, uh, the main limitation we had is the same with, uh, I say anyone who uses word embeddings, it's that uh, uh, there's the question of, well, how to estimate the uncertainty, the uncertainty. So uh, how to estimate standard errors. And that's still a work in progress in machine learning in general, especially when you have models that take a lot of time to estimate. One of the recommendations, for instance, like uh, people like uh, Rodriguez, and Sper Rodriguez and Sperling is to estimate more than one model and take the average. Uh, so uh, in our case, we replicated that. We estimated uh, hundreds of models and we we're confident that the, the estimates were stable enough, but uh, in my current research, I'm uh, looking to uh, to uh, dig deeper into uncertainty and how to measure uncertainty. But uh, yeah, that's the story of that paper and how it came about and uh, uh, why it took so long is uh, we wanted to be uh, more confident. We're never uh, entirely confident, but we wanted to be more confident about how um, about whether this method really uh, captured something that we think is is corresponds to political ideology. And the, I think both my both Chris, my co-author, and I uh, came to the conclusion that, yeah, there seems to be an association where uh, we haven't uncovered uh, the entire the entirety of the puzzle, but it, but it seems to, there seems to be something there that word embeddings can help us to capture. A political ideology, and that's the most exciting part. So I'm happy to uh, uh, engage in a conversation about the, this model. Um, I haven't covered all the parts, but I think I've sp spoken enough already, probably. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for a very um, entertaining, also I think, understandable um, presentation of this initially uh, seemingly complex method and. Uh, I think you did a great job. You know already that I'm a big fan of the paper. 